It's time with JMU Hall of Famer and someone who knows a hell of a lot about taking it to the house. Royce breaks a tackle and goes in for a touchdown. Another spectacular run by Delvin Joyce. Delvin Joyce brings his unique perspective to the podcast to break down all things he's seeing about JMU football. With a little help from EPA King Jack Fitzpatrick and Bennett Conley. Here he goes. He's going to try to beat the putter. He does. He's gone. And that is a touchdown. Welcome into To the House. Getting dark back and forth. Oh, he broke his ankles. Now he's got an entourage. And he's got a touchdown. Now, here's Delvin Joyce with Jack Fitzpatrick and Bennett Conlon. JMU Nation, what's happening? It is your host of To The House, Delvin Joyce, the People's Choice. I'm joined, as always, by my guy, Jack Fitzpatrick, a.k.a. the EPA King, a.k.a. Jay Feezy. What's going on, Jack? You know, you may call me the EPA King. I'm going to call you the Matazone King from here on out. <laughs> Coming fresh I'm off of the broadcast from the press box at Bridgeport Stadium right to the podcast sticks. You got to love it. Man, you're taking people back with Matazone. I mean, I was a, I was like an early adopter of Matazone. So, <laughs> uh, but yeah, man, what a great experience being in the booth. I, I had such a good time. The only bad thing about it, I was sharing this with you in pre-production, is that as I was watching the game back, I was like, all right, I can't wait to hear what these announcers said. And I was like, wait a second, that that's actually me talking. <laughs> <laughs> you're like, I can't wait to hear the the interesting insights that they give. And then you're watching it back and you're like, oh, that's right. I was the one saying the interesting insights and, and saying everything. I got to know pregame meal. What what was the spread up there in Bridgeforth Press Box? Because they, they get some good spreads up there. Yeah. So pregame meal, it was actually really good, but it was like a it was like a taco bar. Ooh. Um, yeah. And I kind of, you know, I'm not one to actually eat a lot before I present. Um. I, and so I, I was considering going in for like the tacos and the refried beans. And then I was like, you know what? That booth isn't big enough for refried beans. <laughs> so I just kind of kind of laid low a little bit and just ate after the game. <laughs> yeah, smart move, smart move. Basketball fans, it's that time of year again. The NBA is back. From opening tip-off to buzzer beaters, Bet Online has you covered with the best odds, biggest promotions, and live in-game betting on all your favorite teams. This season, every game matters. Bet Online has every stat, every matchup breakdown, and live odds to bet on during the game. And it's not just the NBA. Bet Online has odds on everything from football, MLB playoffs, NHL, and so, so much more. Head to the website today to get in on the action with America's most trusted site for online wagering. Bet Online, the game starts here. Be sure to subscribe to the JMU Sports News Network so you never miss an episode. We are your exclusive home for To the House with JMU Hall of Famer Delvin Joyce and the JMU Sports News Podcast with Jack Fitzpatrick and Bennett Conlin. New episodes of To the House drop every Monday and new episodes of the JMU Sports News Podcast drop in the middle of every week. Be sure to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts and YouTube so you never miss an episode. Yeah, but, you know, either way, it was great to see the Dukes get back on track uh, and actually win a game, right? Now, granted, it was against Southern Miss, and there are those of you who will say that Southern Miss was a 1-16, in but I promise you, I did a lot of research and game film and study on this team. That team was a lot better than their 1-6 in record, Jack. Now, I, I don't know what your thoughts were. But did you have expectations that JMU would blow this team out? I mean, I was expecting it. One in six, their their previous displays weren't necessarily fantastic when you just look at overall statistics. Uh, they had just fired their head coach, which may have been because they were underperforming relative to the talent they had on their roster. Uh, but coming into it, I was expecting maybe a little bit more than a 32-15 type of final score. However, all of the nerd stats, all of the nerd numbers that you know I love, I uh, did say that JMU pretty well handed uh, Southern Miss and L. Yeah, it was a, it was an interesting game, and you know, for me, you know, actually broadcasting the game, 
you know, it was hard because as the game got closer, I felt myself getting quieter and being like, yo, what are we doing here? Come on, let's take care of business. Um, but it was, you know, on the field that I feel like the game sort of started to get a little close at times. Obviously, the biggest play, and we'll get into it, was, you know, when they when uh, Crawford went out of the game, they brought in Tate Rodemaker, the backup, who used to be the starter. He mishandles a mesh point with the uh, running back in inside the JMU three yard line and and JMU picks the ball up. So we'll, we'll get into that. I think, you know, as we think about this game, um, you know, one of the one of the bigger themes, though, is that this is for me an any giving Saturday kind of league. <clears throat> And I know we want to blow everybody out. I know that we look at that one and six record and we say we should blow this team out. But I promise you, there is a lot of talent in the Sun Belt Conference from top to bottom. And the one thing that I would point to from this past weekend is not in the JMU game. It was actually in the Georgia Southern uh, game that they had against uh, Old Dominion. And, and we were texting back and forth. I know you were big on the Monarchs, but what an outcome in that game, especially after Georgia Southern really looked like they had the inside track to the Sunbelt East championship after beating us. Yeah. And not to look ahead or anything, but Georgia Southern is now an underdog this weekend against South Alabama with betting lines out there. So in a blink of an eye, Georgia Southern can go from in the driver's seat to now needing help to win. JMU wins out all of those scenarios we'll talk about as the podcast goes on, but that game was, was quite eye opening, but, for me, as an Old Dominion day one stockholder, I'm glad I never sold their stock at one and four. I was pounding my chest that no matter what, Ricky Ronnie, he's just lost a lot of one possession games, Delvin. And finally, yeah. the tides, and that's not supposed to be a, a pun, being that they're in Norfolk and the tides change. You know, the moon may have shifted and the tides have changed for the ODU Monarchs, but they're they're looking legit. They're actually the team that I'm most worried about now in the Sun Belt. Hey, bro, don't, don't try to act like you were the only one <laughs> who, who saw this ODU comeback coming. I mean, I am on wax as saying ODU is the best one in four team in the they, country when they, they were one in four at the time. And I think last week I said they were the best three and four team uh, in the country. And so, you know, you look at Georgia Southern and what they have coming up. And we talked about this last week, you know, as we were talking about the Duke's chances to come back and actually win the Sun Belt East. I mean, they've got to go to South Alabama. Now, they are not a good road team. They play very well inside of Paulson, right? The power of Paulson. But when they have to travel, they don't do so well. And so it's no surprise to me that they are an underdog at South Alabama. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> I think the other thing that I would look at as, as I reflect on this game for, for James Madison I'm, I'm still in my broadcast voice. I have to say James Madison. Now I can say JMU, right? I mean, were you, was that part Would you had to say James Madison? Was that part of their like broadcasting rules? No, I don't think so. I think, okay. I think that was, I think that was me trying to sound impartial because I think okay. if you say JMU, it's kind of a Homer kind of, I don't know. I don't know. Cause we'll, we'll, a, we'll figure that out. A peek behind the curtain for broadcasting. When you go into certain schools, they'll tell you what they want to be called and what they prefer to be called. Like for Elon, when you refer to a school by the school name, so James Madison, Elon, it's an it, right? So it is the Elon, like Elon has gone out there and it has won. But if you're referring it to as the Dukes, it's a they. So the Dukes, they have won a bunch of games this season. For Elon, they want you to refer to the Phoenix as an it in the <laughs> singular because Elon rose from the ashes. Elon was the fighting Christians. Their entire school burned down. They're now the Phoenix because they have risen from the ashes. And at one point in time, this fictional, fan fantastical creature, you can only have one Phoenix living at a certain time. So you refer to the Phoenix in the singular. That's a complete tangent. <laughs> A complete thing that probably no one cares about, but it really grinds my gears. Oh, man. All right. I'm going to put that in the category of TMI. <laughs> However, that was that was that was pretty cool. Now I know. And knowing is half the battle. Right. Um, but, you know, the other thing that I thought was good, and I said this at the end of the broadcast, it was actually really good to see this team actually win and, and win convincingly when they didn't have their best stuff. Right. I mean, I think one of the things that we've heard fans say is that we either have the 70 point or the 63 per point performance 
or we have a game where we struggle to score points like ULM. And it was good in this game. This was kind of that tweener game. I, I think it went, you know, it was kind of back and forth. And then all of a sudden we broke away and then it was a 35 or 32 to 15 final. So really good to see that tweener game. Now let's, let's talk about the offense uh, for a second. And, you know, we saw some of those things that we had seen before on offense where, you know, kind of streaky, maybe an explosive here and there, but when it comes time to actually settle in, drive the ball down the field, somehow our offense just seems to stall out on drives. So much so that we were 2 of 12 on third down conversions and 0 for 2 on fourth down conversions. And Jack, I know you got some EPA stats for me, uh, or you got some analytics to, to make that make sense for me, but what do you got for me right now, Jack? I mean, none of it really makes sense. And that's the most annoying part as like, as this, as someone who like, I almost enjoy looking at the statistics and the advanced stats sometimes more than watching the actual game. Of course not. I, I love watching football, but you try to figure out what's actually happening and kind of trying to figure out the story behind what you're watching. And the stats just don't back it up. The stats still say that JMU is a, a very, uh, not a very good, but a good top tier Sunbelt offense. And you watch the offense and you're just like, my eyes are not telling me that at times. At times, the offense plays exceptionally well, but at other times, they are abysmal on third down. They're setting themselves up into these third and long situations. They can't convert on fourth down and they're uber aggressive on fourth down. And you're sitting there and you're like, what is the issue? Is it, is it play calling? Is it poor, poor pressure recognition from Bar Barnett? Is it a mixture of both? Is it the offensive line play? Is it just bad luck? Cause sometimes it just comes down to luck. It's, it's really head scratching. Yeah, it, it is. It is a head scratcher and I've been trying to figure it out. I think some of it is just play calling rhythm. Um, but I also think that right now we've got some injuries on, on the offensive side of the ball. We're, we're pretty banged up on the offensive line. So I, I do think, you know, Jack, this, this bye week comes at a perfect time. <laughs> um, but I do think it's a great opportunity for us to at least get some of those offensive linemen healthy get them back in the lineup and maybe that will solve some of the protection issues because Barnett was hurried a lot during this game, although he was only sacked four times. And I say only because we managed to sack their quarterback like nine times, but I mean, four sacks is still a lot. 15 for 25 passing though, only 135 yards. He did throw two touchdown passes. The two touchdown passes that he threw, I thought were, exceptional especially the one of taylor thompson uh in the corner of the end zone fantastic throw fantastic catch by taylor thompson and then finding cam ross in the seam uh down at the goal line i also thought was a really good find at that situation in the uh in the ball game especially when they needed it right yeah cam ross answered the call multiple times the the kick return touchdown i think he knew you were up in the booth so he had to had to show Man. off for the all-time leader in all-purpose yards but i mean that that's just a a exclamation point there for jmu Man, that dude had a game man i uh i got a chance to see him after the game dapped him up i told him how fired up i was to see him return that kick um and i gotta tell you something man you got you don't know how hard that is like when i, I was don't. playing i hate it getting the ball in the second half because that that meant that I had to walk out of the locker room. I'm not as loose as I was before the game started. I probably got some nicks and bruises from the first half and to have to go out in the first play is I got to return a kick like that sucked. I was always give me the first kick of the game. I want to take that one to the house. Um, so for Cam Ross to come out of the locker room kind of cold and take that thing to the crib, man, I thought that was amazing. And I don't know if you heard, but during the broadcast, I maybe snuck in a plug for to the house. <laughs> um, but yeah, really, really good play by, I mean, I was just blown away that he made that play in that game. Whew. Now, so I, I want to talk about, so Barnett obviously had the really bad interception. The first time that we've really seen him make a poor decision, the first interception that he threw this season was at uh, uh, at Charlotte. And he thought he had drawn the team off, off, off sides, right? And he just threw it up, right? He took a shot. 
He did what he was coached to do, except that he didn't look to confirm that they had called the offsides, even though the guy was offside. He was very offsides. This one, I think it was him saying, you know what? I, I, they, they're coaching me up. I can't take these sacks in these situations. I got to find a way to get rid of the ball. And he was trying to throw that ball away. It's just that the defender had a handle on him and he couldn't get enough strength on it to throw it away. So he just threw it up for grabs. Oh man, that, whew, that, that one, I was watching it. Like he's not going to do it. Is he? Oh, oh, he did. Oh, he did. Yeah, and from the press box, it looked like that ball was headed out of bounds. <laughs> and then for it to get caught in the middle of the field, I was like, what was that? That was weird. But again, I still have faith in him as a signal caller. I think that that was just, you know, maybe a one-off. And and by the way, when you think about Southern Mississippi, um, they are actually a really good team against the pass. So it does not surprise me that we were held to 15 of 25 passing and 135 yards. Also considering that we had a short field for much of the game. So there wasn't a lot of available yards at times for us to actually get in the passing game, right? Um, but they are fourth in the Sun Belt in pass defense. They had a really good secondary. They have P4 transfers at the cornerback position. I think one guy was from uh, Purdue, a Big Ten transfer. The other guy was from Ole Miss. So really good um, transfers in those positions that experienced linebackers. They were all seniors and or grad students and their front four were all super experienced. So the defense over there is not terrible against the pass where they were vulnerable was against the run. And we've seen that all season. I think they are coming into this game. They were 13th in the Sun Belt or 14th actually and run defense. And of course, finally, we saw our running game get going. Uh, led by, of course, my favorite player, George Petaway, a.k.a. Shady Petaway, right? But Petaway runs for a career high 119 yards on 16 carries. And he had some really good highlight runs, I think, during that game and just made some really big plays to keep us in it. So I guess your thoughts on on Petaway and the overall running back room uh, in this game. Thank goodness he got more than 15 carries. That had kind of been like the spot that, that that was the ceiling for him throughout this entire season. I think he had more than 15 once before it was against UNC, his former team. I understand that he has 16 carries, averages 7.4 yards per carry. It, it felt good that at times they were leaning on the run. I would have, and this is shocking coming from me. I, I've been a Seahawks fan my entire life. Pete Carroll ran the ball way too much. I'm a big pass the ball, pass the ball type of guy. But with all that being said, I wanted them to run the ball a little bit more. I've won. I've been clamoring for that all season. I would have liked to see running the ball a little bit more in this game, but I can't complain too, too much with a 32, 15 win. The ends justify the means. But, I mean, Petaway balled out. Wayne Knight, 59-yarder long of the season. I believe the longest rush for any JMU running back this year. Uh, kind of sad that he got caught from behind. I, I hope yeah. that his teammates give him hell about that. But even Petaway doesn't wear, doesn't tuck in his shirt, doesn't have the tearaway shirt, and gets pulled down from behind with his undershirt. I mean, come on, guys. Yeah, that was bad. I mean, Wayne Knight, uh, you know, that monkey jumped on his back. And I saw his brother, Yamir, go over and give him some crap. And he's like, yo, you got to get in the end zone, man. Take that to the house. I really thought Wayne was going to take that to the house, but really good run by him. Love to see that he, he made something out of nothing on that run. I would have loved to have seen that be sort of a design run that actually went as planned, but also really cool to see him make something out of nothing. I was very, very sad to see that Tyler Purdy got hurt in that game. If you listen to uh, Bob Chesney's press conference today, he said Purdy broke his leg. So he is out for the season. And that's a big loss. Again, I said it on the broadcast. That guy is a Swiss Army knight for this team. A Swiss Army knife for this team. I was thinking about the Knight brothers. <laughs> Swiss Army knight. Um, but yeah, I mean, he catches passes. He's our short, uh, short, short yardage back. And he's really good in pass protection at times. And so really going to miss him. Wish him all the luck. I mean, that really sucks for him to have that kind of injury, but you know, he's a smart guy. He's going to do well in life. <clears throat> now, the thing that was missing for me was, was no Dollison. 
I mean, I don't think Dollison even got targeted in this game. So, I mean, I, I, I looked for him in some of the route schemes and combinations, and I just did not see a lot of opportunities to give him the ball. Now, I don't know if that's because we're running him on that deep route because he's like the fastest guy on the team, but he needs more intermediate passes where he can catch the ball and make somebody miss and go to the crib. So um, any thoughts on Dollison not getting any targets? It was interesting that not only did Dollison not get any targets, but they didn't target any real deep route. And it seems that they had a few in the Georgia Southern game, but the percentage of routes that have been run past the sticks and have been targeted by Barnett past the sticks have just kind of exponentially dropped since the ULM game. And, you know, the, the analytical brain of myself is probably saying, you know, it's because teams are now bringing a lot more pressure. They've kind of found the Alonzo Barnett. This offense is kryptonite, you know, maybe playing too high cover shells where you can't necessarily go over the top as easily. But still not having any targets to Dallas and not trying to stretch the field really at all. The only time they stretched the field was a Do Taji Hudson double pass to start the second half. And with Taji Hudson, you mentioned it on the broadcast, an amazing pull came into college as a quarterback. He had a good arm, but I mean, he doesn't have the Alonzo Barnett arm. So <laughs> it goes about 30 air yards. It was very interesting that they seemingly bailed on the deep ball entirely in that game. Yeah, I was uh, and that deep ball went to Wayne Knight, by the way, yeah. like it went to the running back. Um, you know, it was interesting, though. I was it was cool to see that we still had the playbook open, even if even though it was a one in six team. I think coming into the game, they were expecting uh, Southern Mississippi to run some trick plays. We were the ones that actually ran a double reverse to Cam <laughs> Ross, and we ran a, a, a wide receiver throwback uh, to, with uh, Taji Hudson. But, yeah, very interesting. I really want to see Dollison get involved in the offense uh, a lot more. Um, Barnett didn't seem to target a lot of people outside of uh, Cam Ross, Yamir Knight, and the running backs, right? Um, and so really want to see – him sort of spread that ball around a little bit because I think that's one of the things that made us dynamic. And as we think about some of the woes on second, or I'm sorry, on third down and fourth down, you know, one of the things that I think Chesney has said is that sometimes it really comes down to efficiency on first and second down. So if we don't get productive yards on first and second down, that puts us behind the chains. And now we've got a longer play to make for that third down conversion. Well, I got to tell you, a lot of times, if you look at this game, I mean, there were some times where we were behind the change and there was like third and eight, third and nine, third and eight plus. But there were also times where it was third and three, third and four, and we failed to convert. I mean, we didn't convert a fourth and one, uh, which could have kept the drive alive. That would have been a very important touchdown. And so I, I think part of the challenge is that that identity that we've all talked about for this team is that explosive offense. And if you are an explosive offense, you live by the explosives and sometimes you die by the explosives. And we have to find a way to build consistency on the offensive side of the ball to drive the ball down the field and possess the football because our defense is standing on the field a lot. Yeah, uh, that game had a 5% explosive play rate for JMU, which is one of their lowest numbers of the season. Uh, one of the lowest numbers across all of college football. Uh, on that Saturday, Southern Miss also finished the game with a 5% explosive play rate. But but kind of going back to what you said, out of all of the downs, first down is by far the most important. And you can't, as an explosive play team, in my, in my opinion, as an explosive play team, you have to be able to effectively run the ball on first down and efficiently run the ball on first down because you cannot rely on the explosive plays on first and 10 because an explosive play only hits on the good side 30 percent of the time maybe so you're sitting at second and 10 70 percent of the time y you have to figure out a way on how to push the ball stay ahead of the sticks get that successful run on first down so that first and 10 becomes second and five and then your whole playbook opens up and then you can go from there and figure things out yeah, that's a that's a fantastic point. And, you know, to to that point, I think on defense, you said that we kept Southern Miss from some of those explosive plays. And I was actually worried about that quarterback coming into this game. I mean, he he is a quick guy. 
I think he changed the dynamic of their offense. He's led their team in rushing for the last two weeks. And, and really just overall, I think a good kid too. Like I really, you know, in watching film and preparing for the broadcast, I really enjoyed watching him play because he just seems to play with a lot of happiness and joy. And so I, I really appreciated that about him. But I think what you saw on the defensive side of the ball, knowing that we had a true sophomore quarterback who was going to be starting this game, I think we saw a much more aggressive game plan from him, right? Coach Hemphill had a much more aggressive game plan because last week he said his game plan was what, Jack? What was it? What did he, he say? He, he said trash. He said, trash. He said my third down prey calling was trash. So very candid look at the mind of Lyle Hemphill in, uh, in his press post-game presser uh, last week. But this week, again, he said he wanted to be a lot more aggressive, and we saw that. We didn't see that aggression against Georgia Southern, though, and, and J.C. French, the quarterback at Georgia Southern, made us pay. I mean, that guy was running around. He was making plays. And then probably if you saw any of this, uh, this game against Old Dominion, Old Dominion does maybe the best job of anybody in the entire Sun Belt of bringing pressure, mixing things up, trying to confuse offensive line, linemen. They were very aggressive. And that aggressive game plan paid off, and French and company did not handle it well. <clears throat> so much so that he got benched again, I think. I think they benched him and brought back in Dexter Williams. So, again, I know that uh, Coach Hemphill would want a mulligan if he could go down and play <laughs> Georgia Southern again. Hopefully he sticks around with the Dukes next year and we get to play him again in Bridgeforth. Um, but Crawford, again, dynamic player, led the team in rushing two, two weeks in a row. But this week, he only had 10 yards rushing against Lyle Hemphill's defense. And the best part is we sacked him nine times. I mean, that's nine times. I mean, getting sacked nine times for that elusive of a quarterback to get him on the ground nine times, I think is phenomenal. That is an insane number. And then not only the nine sacks, Jacob Dobbs had two TFLs. Kyrie Manns had one. Uh, Thomas had half of one, Eric O'Neill, one and a half, Hendrick, Barksdale, Daryl De Dingua. Dengoy. Dengoy. Ah. Yeah. Well, that's Dengoy. how we said it in the box. <laughs> yeah. D Dengoy. I'll go with that. They have one. Emmanuel Bush has one. I mean, like everyone along that all defensive line essentially had also then a TFL. Yeah, we had 11 of them. Um, and again, aggressive game planning. I, I honestly, at this point in the season, you know, six and two needing to win out. I do believe that this more aggressive defense is what we're going to see from here on out, because as you can see, it was very effective against this quarterback. We're also going to face some other young quarterbacks, uh, Joey Aguilar, uh, notwithstanding. But the kid at Old Dominion, young quarterback, I think he's a freshman, yeah. right? I don't know who's playing quarterback at Marshall now. Um, I think um, Georgia State has another young quarterback. So, again, we're going to see young quarterbacks, and I think Lyle Hemphill dialing up the pressure, doing what I think other teams are trying to do to our young quarterback, Alonzo Barnett the third. I think is the way to go. I mean, so I was really excited to see that. I saw Dobbs got hurt a little bit. He should be back, but 10 tackles, two sacks. Some belt defensive player of the week. Finally, good to see him get his flowers, especially coming off of a 17 tackle performance in a loss last week. Right. So probably some belt player of the week last week if he doesn't get hurt. Yeah, 27 tackles in eight quarters is pretty good. I, I love that you uh you said Kyrie Kyrie Manz's name, right? Because I saw him coming out of the locker room uh the other day and I was like, I was like, what's up, Kyrie? And he was like, it's Kyrie. And I was like, oh, my my bad, my guy, <laughs> Kyrie. But yeah, Kyrie, man, I love that dude. He has seven tackles and a sack. He's a, such a good player. And then, of course, T. Spence comes up with another interception. So two takeaways for the Dukes in this game, plus one in the turnover margin, still leading in takeaways, still leading in turnover margin, and really excited that Dingoy had that, had that big game as well. So... I mean, I think the defense performed pretty well. The only thing, you know, that one drive they had, you know, uh, Southern Miss had a pretty nice drive down the field in the, uh, I guess that was in the second half, right? Their first drive in the second half. Like they drove it down and, you know, it was like a like a really good drive. And, and they capped it with like a 15-yard run 
by yep. their running back. And so out of, outside of that, I think the defense was pretty phenomenal uh, dominant performance. That first field goal that they gave up was, you know, because we went for it in our own territory, I think, and gave them really good field possession and held them to a field goal. And then the other field goal, I think, was a pick from Barnett. You know, I think they went down and, and got three points there, maybe. Um, but really, I think overall a great performance by the defense. Special teams, Jack. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Give me some EPA say, stats. No, I'm just – I think I'm coming back to your side of it. Um, I didn't like going for it on fourth down in that first quarter. I think I'm coming <laughs> back to your side where you stopped going for it on fourth down. Man, so I love the call. I, I, thought, I don't think we're ever going to get on. I, I love it. And the first qu – oh, yeah. No, no, no. Sorry, sorry. No, I didn't love that call. Yeah, the no, first quarter no. one was like, what are we doing? Yeah, I, th I, on I think that was homecoming crowd. I yeah. think it was – we're at home. We're in front of a homecoming crowd. We need we need a spark. We're playing a team that's one and six. I don't think they can beat us, even if we don't get this. I think that was the calculation there. Yeah. Um, I that. did like, you know, the other fourth down call. It was fourth and one. You know, if you remember, Yarmir Knight was coming across, caught a pass, and just came up just short of the first down uh, marker. And then, you know, we decided to go for it. Now, of course, at that point, we were without Purdy. And so George Petaway takes the short yeah. yardage, uh, fourth and one carry. Not really his forte, I don't think. And so, you know what I'm going to say? You know what it's time for? You know, you and you and uh, you and Ben are going to be happy. Because <laughs> I, I do think that going forward, we're going to have to see Joby Mallory. Like, we're going to have to see this guy Woo, come into Joby! the game. <laughs> Yeah, and and Joby had a carry in this game, and he looked good, man. I mean, he looked like he runs downhill. He's a big load. I, I gotta, I gotta think that the guy can come in and pick up fourth and one, right? At a minimum, he so. he falls forward, and he should be able to pick up fourth and three. Like he is a large, large human. No, no he's a he's a big guy. I think George Petaway said it on the uh, on the uh, press conference today. Um, in his comments, he said, you know, Joby came in late, came in uh, during during the summer. So it's really hard for a guy to come in during training camp, try to learn a play playbook. And that was our suspicion. We had said, you know, maybe he's not up to speed on the playbook and maybe that's why he's not getting the type of burn that we think he should be getting. Um, but he's going to have to play a role now. So is Wayne Knight. Wayne Knight's going to have a bigger role. We got Purdy out. We got Io Adeyi out. And, and George Petaway, you know, he he's averaging around 14 carries a game at this point, right? This last week, 16 carries was the most he's gotten all season. And so I, I cannot see him carrying more of a workload than that, nor do yeah. I think he should. I think Wayne Knight and Joby Mallory are going to have to pick up the pick up the slack. Yeah, for sure. So I guess as we think about special teams, I mean, one of my challenges right now, obviously, is in our kicking game because for the for for back to back weeks, you know, we missed a field goal last week at Georgia Southern. We missed an extra point uh, this past week, and so the question is, when is No Way Ruelas coming back? I have no I, idea. I also don't know what his injury is. Like I. I assume it might be a pull to hammy or something along those lines, but not 100% sure what that is. And uh, it, it's a, it's a pretty drastic fall off. And it wasn't Max Lipinski, the true freshman kicking this last Saturday. It was Cristiano Rosa, the central Connecticut state transfer came in. So uh, even Chesney's looking to try and pull some dials and, or push some dials and pull some levers <laughs> uh, to try and to find an answer in Ruelas's absence. Yeah, and I think they did fine, right? I mean, I think, you know, both of those guys are are working their butts off. They're young guys. They're going to be fine over time. But, yeah. you know, what we want is the guy who uh, we thought was going to give us this experienced kicker who's got a huge leg, who can make him from pretty much anywhere, and um, would be nice to see him return just so we have a little more stability there. I do think Rosa and uh, Lipinski are going to be great players for us at some point. Uh, just want to see Ruelas get healthy, get back on the field. You know, the other concern was our punt return coverage. And that guy, Ty Mims, for Southern Miss, I think he was a special player. I mean, I'm looking at him as a former NFL punt returner. And I was like, yo, this dude is a beast. I mean, he was really good 
as a punt returner. In fact, he took one to the house that fortunately for us got called back. Um, and I think, you know, if I'm the ref on, in that situation, I probably let that one slide. I mean, it was kind of a, a blindside block, but it was kind of a good block. <laughs> it was a good block. I man. think you said on the broadcast back in your day, that was, that was a completely legal block. Back in my day, that guy is getting a helmet sticker on, on <laughs> Sunday morning. <laughs> Like, I mean, seriously, that was a, that was a fantastic block. And so I think what that guy's got to do is he's, he's just got to run there and get in the way and throw his hands up. Can't hit him. Yeah. But because that was an electric return, um, by, uh, by Mims. And so, you know, the question is, is that the, the product of an exceptional player for Southern Miss, which I do think that guy in the return game, he dropped some passes as a receiver, but in the return game, that guy was special. So was it the fact that he's special or are there some cracks in our uh, punt return coverage? And then, of course, we had the extra point block um, by Dengoy and then Chris Sheeran picks it up and takes it to the house, which that was a big play. That was a momentum play right there. So huge. Yeah, I mean, I, I, and honestly, I mean, it looked like the monkey that got on Wayne Knight's back also jumped on Sheeran's back because I saw him kind of slowing down a little bit, but he had an entourage with him. But I was worried that he was actually going to get to the end zone. But that was huge because it changed the game. I mean, they literally, if they make that extra point, it is a seven point ball game. They block the extra point. So they lose a point. We score two. And now all of a sudden, it's a two possession ball game, 10 point lead just like that that was the biggest play of the game i thought and that's coming right off of the heels of the missed extra point from jmu so you come out of the halftime you get cam ross to return it to the house touchdown you can't tack on seven you only have six kind of keeps the door open a little bit here for southern miss they go right down the field and score and and then like you said it's a three-point swing all of a sudden jmu has the lead again and it seems insurmountable because southern miss's offense couldn't uh, efficiently and effectively and consistently move the ball. Yeah. So, I mean, again, really good. I think when, because it was nice to see that we didn't have the a game, but they still won the game. Right. And they won the game against a team that they should beat. And they, even though they didn't cover the spread, I don't even care about any of that stuff. I don't, <laughs> I don't, I've never bet on a, on a sports game. You know that? I've never placed a bet. I don't even know how to do that. You'll you'll have to school me up. It's pretty but, simple. <laughs> <laughs> but but they still win by three possessions, right? A three possession win. Again, a very pedestrian win. Nothing glamorous. There were some highlights, Cam Ross, um, but nothing exceptional. I do think though, going into this bye week, it is a fantastic opportunity to get this team healthy. And I also think that it's a it's an opportunity to fix some of the kinks that we have seen, not only in the passing game, but just in the offense and even on the defensive side of the ball. And we got some special teams things. So, again, a great opportunity to 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 really uh, dial up some some good things that can uh, start this streak, Jack, and finish 10 and two. What do you think? You, you, you got to work on a lot of things uh, coming out of the bye week. It's no, it's no cupcake schedule, Georgia state at home. And then you're playing at ODU off of a bye week ODU coming off of their bye week. Then you're playing at app state app state coming off of their bye week. And then you're finishing with Marshall and that mate Marshall, that Marshall game. I hope, I hope no thundering herd fan is listening in clips. This. That might be the easiest game remaining on the schedule. I mean, Georgia State is a team that beat Vanderbilt and any given Saturday type of thing. Georgia State can clearly win on any given Saturday. Uh, transitive property win is going to go crazy if we're able to beat Georgia State because then that means we beat Alabama. <laughs> you got but, it. Uh, yeah, the bye week, going to have to gonna have to figure out this offense because while it, it has the moments, it is – they got to find that consistency and that's really tough to do. I feel like in the middle of a season, but uh, it's something that Dean Kennedy is probably going Dean Kennedy, Bob Chesney and Alonzo Barnett, the trio of them are going to be up until the wee hours of the morning. Probably a lot of these nights during the bye week trying to figure out the solutions to whatever test is given to them each week. 
Yeah, I, I mean, I, I got faith. I mean, I, I do think 10 and 2 is on the table. I do think yes. Georgia Southern is in trouble. Um, and I, you know, the team that that scares me the most that's on our schedule right now is probably App State. I mean, again, the team can't look ahead, but but we can. Obviously concerned about Old Dominion because we have to go there, but we also have to go to Boone. And, you know, if you watch how they played this past week, it looks like they, you know, kind of trying to right the ship a little bit and trying to win some games. And so I would not be surprised if they're not in the mix, you know, to play spoiler down the uh, down the stretch. Yeah, yeah. I'm so worried about ODU, man. I'm so worried about the Monarchs. Yeah, that's in-state rival, though. I mean, I, I listen, JMU kind of, you know, I think JMU takes care of business against Old Dominion, but um again by week perfect time looking forward to the dukes getting healthy getting some players back and and really just going on a run so bowl eligible already but we can really get a good bowl and actually go somewhere fun right i mean jack <laughs> i think on my wish list if i had to give you like a top three it Hit would me. be new orleans okay right? dukes in new orleans that would be fun I don't want to go back to Texas, right? So no more Texas. No no more Texas. We did that already. No more Texas. New Orleans, South Florida. So I mean I mean the Boca Bowl is not like the greatest bowl, but if we if we finish like 7 and 5 and we end up in the Boca Raton, I would love that. That would be a blast, right? And then maybe the Bahamas Bowl. I I'll I'll, I'll buy plane <laughs> tickets and go to the Bahamas. I don't I mean, especially in December, are you kidding me? Th All right, Jack. Three, good, the three good ones. Three good ones. All right. So you know what time it is, Jack. It is time, I think, for your favorite segment. It is what you talking about, Willis. What you talking about? What you talking about? What you talking about? What you what you talking about, Willis? <laughs> All right. So this one, this one might be a little controversial for me, Jack, but Ooh. this week's what you talking about, Willis, comes from a guy named Peter Futak. I, I really like his call. He, he, he's, uh, he's the publisher of college football news and I really like him. I follow him on Twitter. He's, he, you know, spits a lot of facts about college football, um, and college football news. I mean, he really does a good job keeping people up to date on what's happening in college football. He's done really good coverage, by the way, on the college football playoff and, you know, really, really good, uh, publisher. But this week he tweeted, if Indiana, you knew I was, you knew I was going here, right, Jack? If Indiana was named Florida or Oklahoma or Florida State or Michigan or USC or Washington or Auburn or dot dot dot, it would be at least number two in both polls with a whole slew of number one votes. Peter, what are you talking about, Willis? I mean, Jack, do you believe that? Do you believe that if Indiana, with their record in the season that they're having, they were 8-0, that they would be number two in the country right now? No, but it is wild they're 13th. <laughs> yeah, and, and by the way, I think 13 is right. And, and I'm, you know, this is no shade to Indiana or Signetti or any of the players who left. I'm actually really happy for them. I'm glad they're having success. That is fantastic. But I do not believe, and again, Peter says they would be the number two team in the country right now if they were named Florida. No chance. I mean, they've beaten one team with a winning record at this point. One team. Who is that one team? You were there. Nebraska. They beat Nebraska. And they, and they pulled their pants down and just whooped them. I mean, yeah, they just, I mean, they smoked them. Don't get no, don't get it twisted. And by the way, they beat them worse than Ohio State beat them this week, the number <laughs> three or four team in the country. I agree. But again, Ohio State has a history of success. All the teams that he talked about have a history of success. And, and if you are Indiana, you kind of got to put it on the field and you got to prove it. And the good news for them is they're going to have an opportunity over the next four weeks to prove that they deserve to be in the top 10 if that's where they're going to be. I, I agree. I will say, though, I think they should be ranked higher than BYU. I think they okay. should be ranked higher by no, higher than Notre Dame, whose one loss came at home against Northern Illinois, who's been horrible since that win. Like, 
and I know the AP top 25 really doesn't mean anything. It's all popularity contests voted on media members who don't have enough time to actually watch all of the games happening around college football. I understand it, <laughs> but it, it, it just is kind of insane that Indiana at eight. No is behind teams like BYU, like Notre Dame. So you Those think in, you think Indiana is better than Notre Dame right now? Yes. Okay, hang on a second. What you talking about, Willis? <laughs> so Notre Dame has beat Texas A and M. Okay. Right? So 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 Texas A and M. By the way, I mean I just want to make sure you understand this. Texas A and M right now seven just one. throttled LSU, and Texas A and M is seven and one. All right. Yeah. No, Notre Dame beat that SEC school. Notre Dame right? lost to Northern Illinois. Okay, no, no, no. I understand that. I mean, it's a any given Saturday, bro. I mean, you can lose a game, but I'm just telling you, the quality of their wins are better than that loss, right? They also beat Louisville, Notre Dame did. They also beat a pretty good Georgia Tech team, and they just beat an undefeated Navy team and, and, and throttled them and proved that they were actually fool's gold. So, I mean, listen, Notre Dame has won four games against teams with winning records. Indiana at this point has beaten one team, Jack, with a winning record. Their schedule is backloaded, so they'll get an opportunity to prove it. I hope they do, by the way. I think it's one of the greatest stories in college football. I'm just saying that, you know, you can't say that there's a bias against Indiana when they've never done it in football, and they've only beaten a team with one team with a winning record, right? I'll tell you who else is kind of fool's gold. Army, I mean... They, they, their, their, their opponents have a combined FBS wins of like six. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I see your point. I see your point. I just went to Bloomington. I drank the Kurt Signetti Kool-Aid. I'm, I watched them beat up on Washington. I watched the D'Angelo Ponds pick six and I was sitting there and I was like, you know, I'm going to get fully behind Indiana. I'm going to get all the way in on the bandwagon. Because it's fun, it's a fun story, and it's like rooting for JMU. No, so, I listen, I love that part of it because we get so much positive press just by Indiana winning. It's so the, it, have you listened to a broadcast? I have. It's literally the, JMU, JMU, JMU <laughs> all the time. D'Angelo Pines intercepts it, the James Madison transfer, and it's like, <laughs> hell yeah, that's our guy. Yeah. And you know, it's uh you know, I will say it's kind of bittersweet because on the one side, yeah. I'm like, man, we we would have a CFP Boise State type of team in Harrisonburg this year, if not for, you know, the departure of 13 absolute studs on on that team. Right. So but yeah, they wouldn't be the number two team in the country right now, though. Not not with that resume. I'm sorry. I mean, listen, they get a chance to prove it. I mean, what do they have coming up? They got. You know, this coming week, they have, I think, Michigan State, right? A four and four Michigan State. Uh, they got Michigan, of course, but they got them at home. They got, then they got Ohio State, and then they end with Purdue. So, you know, I, I actually believe Signetti's, I mean, he's, 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 those two games against Michigan and Ohio State, like he is dying for those games. Oh, like, yeah. Yeah. No, he's, he's already game planning for those games. I guarantee you. They may hang 70 on Michigan. That would be hilarious. I would, uh, I would love to see that. <laughs> All right, Jack, it's getting late, man. Let's let's uh, let's take it to the house. And you know, Jack, as the Dukes head into the bye week, I think we've all determined, and we've talked about it tonight, that there are some problems they need to sort out, especially on the offensive side of the ball. And as we are less than two weeks from the presidential election, I can't believe that's right around the corner. I'm reminded of a quote from the 34th president of the United States and five-star general, Dwight D. Eisenheimer. He said, whenever I run into a problem I can't solve, I always make it bigger. I can never solve it by trying to make it smaller, but if I make it big enough, I can begin to see the outlines of a solution. Now, to me, that's such a fascinating framing and counterintuitive to how most people think about problem solving. Because for most people, avoidance is perhaps the easiest, but eventually the most painful way to handle a problem. Besides, bad news doesn't get better with time. Some people will try to mask the problem 
you know, cover it up, put a Band-Aid over it for a short-term fix. But rarely does that result in long-term success and oftentimes can lead to short-term disaster. Remember, the crime is usually in the cover-up. But Eisenhower said to solve the problem by making it bigger, by broadening the scope to find more effective solutions. Instead of focusing narrowly on a specific issue, like we suck on third down, he suggested looking at the larger context and considering how the problem fits into a bigger picture. Because when you're inside the jar, it's hard to read the label. Jack, I know we joke about the bye week and how all coaches say it comes at a perfect time, but this will undoubtedly provide a perfect opportunity for this staff eight games into the season with 60 plus new players that they've known for less than a year to get outside the jar and show us the solutions through results on the field. And don't forget, last time, they solved a lot of problems by dropping 70 on Chapel Hill. And that's it, Dukes. We are taking it to the house. Thank you so much for tuning in to, to the house. Jack, why don't you tell the people how they can find, follow us, and subscribe and all that good stuff. Yeah, keep it locked to, to the house on uh, Twitter and Instagram at JMU to the house. And you can keep it locked to all things happening on the JMU Sports News Network by liking, subscribing, and rating wherever you may be listening. Just hit the subscribe button on Apple Podcasts, Spotify Podcasts. Uh, subscribe on YouTube if you're watching there, and you'll never miss an episode of To The House, which drops every Monday night, or the Jamie Sports News Podcast, which drops in the middle of every week. Way to go, man. Have you ever solved a problem by making it bigger, Jack? Have you ever, have you ever heard that framing? No, I typically try to make my problems as small as possible so I can forget about them and move on. Blow them up, man. Blow them up and make them as big as possible. (laughs) And I promise you, man, it works. And, And until next time, JMU Nation, thank you for tuning in. Let's take it to the house. Go Dukes. To the House is part of the JMU Sports News Network. New episodes of To the House with JMU Hall of Famer Delvin Joyce drop every Monday and episodes of the JMU Sports News Podcast drop in the middle of every week. Subscribe to the JMU Sports News Network wherever you find your podcast and never miss an episode. You can watch every episode of To the House on the JMU Sports News YouTube. Stay updated on social at JMU Sports News and at JMU to the house and at our website, jmusportsnews.com.